We're going to get started. Let's come take a seat up front, those who can stick around. Yes. Come on up and sit up front for a little while. I will grab a few more chairs and we are gonna hear from Reverend Durrell. Friends, you're welcome to join us for a little chit chat. <laughs> One, uh, yeah, no, no problem. Um, while we're waiting for some other friends to join us, I would just say if there are questions. Um, there isn't anything that's, that can't be on the table. So if there are questions about the conference, what that is, what it means, um, questions, I think somebody's had asked me a question about our um, diversity, equity, and inclusion office and kind of what's happening with that with some of our reorg. So I'd be more than happy um, to talk about that or anything that sort of comes up. The last time I was here, we spent a really healthy amount of time talking about what does racial justice ministry look like in Lincoln Sudbury? And when I said that I often reflect on this church, <clears throat> that was such a great modeling of how to have a back and forth between a local parish and the conference. And so I have often shared my experience of that conversation to encourage some of your sibling congregations <laughs> that they may want to have similar um, discussions. I want to start just sharing a little bit more about Find Hope Now, um, and then, of course, like I said, opening it up to other questions. <clears throat> if you live in the same world that I live in, you see a growing um, ilk of Christian nationalism, and Christian nationalism in a way that further isolates, alienates, and creates an even deeper tension between an us and a them mentality. Um, I don't know how many of you are Super Bowl fans, but <clears throat> if you watched the Super Bowl this year, you would have seen a multi-million dollar commercial from an organization called He Gets Us. And it's, fat, it's flashy and seemingly exciting, and you're like, oh, this is like a hip version of trying to introduce you to, quote, Christianity. But if you under look beyond the flashiness of the multi-million dollar ad, what you see is that He Gets Us is funded by the same organizations who funded the anti-abortion movements that are funding um, some of the legislation that's becoming real in Florida and Texas, um, the policing of women's bodies, the everything. I mean, it's the same money that is doing that and at the same time giving this image of Jesus that He Gets Us. And so what I became so tempered by when the first commercial was at the Super Bowl, um, I wrote a column in the Connecticut Mirror and simply described it as what I would say is a bait and switch. Come seemingly to openness and, you know, the, the people in the ads are, you know, 
queer and they're African American and they're homeless and they're everything. And you think, oh wow, social justice. But then realize, no. Like essentially, these are all the things wrong with the world. And if you just join our church, you can be cleaned up from it. That's the subtext. You get in the door and then you're given that this is how we want to change you. So I wonder, well, what could we do as 600 churches in New England to confront a multi-million dollar you know, campaign? And I was driving uh, with my husband, Kenny, and I just said, God, I just wish we could find hope and find it now. And he looked at me and said, Yes, <laughs> like we, you know. So I, this is Sunday, and please forgive my for my staff. Forgive me. I immediately called our digital minister and said, "Does findhopenow.org exist?" And he's like, "Give me ten minutes. I'll call you back." He calls back and he says, "No, it's available." And I'm like, "Buy it now." <laughs> and then it's like, "What about findhopenow.com?" I'm like, "We should buy that too, just so some other organization." And so they purchase and they go, "Okay, what are we gonna do with this?" And I'm like, "I'm not sure, but I know that we need to help people find hope now." So we partnered with a multimedia firm called uh, Social Driver um, that does a number of contract work for the government, for some big tent companies, um, and they've helped them sort of digital, digitally describe themselves and market themselves. So they've designed our logo for Find Hope Now. They just finished our website for Find Hope Now. And the next phase is they're going to be developing marketing tools for our churches that will be accessible and downloadable for you to put your own touch to it. All center around how are you finding hope here? The reason is very specific is the, the digital imprints, you can download them and add your piece to it. There'll be some uniformity so that hopefully wherever you are in Southern New England, you might see the image of some kind of banner or work and go, I think I've seen that someplace else. Maybe I saw that on the Cape. Maybe I saw that in Southern California. I was in Newport last weekend and I saw something similar to this. That's the hope um, of, of how these resources will be used. We're going to spend about $10,000 a month in Google ads. We got a grant from Google that if you search for a church in southern New England, one of our churches are probably going to come up based on your location. We'll be tracking how many new unique visitors um, are visiting that Find Hope Now site and therefore visiting your church's pages. Um, we just did a a pool of some data from the month of January. In the month of January, over 670 people visited the Southern New England Conference website, unique people that had never been there before. Do you know the number one thing that they looked up? How to find a church. I think when we think of a world where it's like, well, people aren't into churches or religion or they're not even thinking about this, and so should we even be the 600 plus people we're on the Southern New England Conference website, and because you know there's little things crawling to track everything you're doing, we can track that the majority of them went to how to find a church. There's a church finder on our website. So I don't think this is for not. I think this is important. I think, and that's without us doing any marketing. So imagine marketing the site, marketing Find Hope Now. Um, I want to see that double and triple and quadruple. I know it may sound quirky to say it's, we're doing all this not necessarily with the expectation that any of these people will join any of our churches. You may think, well, okay, what are you doing? What, what's happening? For me, it's awareness, knowledge, skills, action. Action is the fourth. Awareness is I believe God hates me because of who I am. I went to a site called Find Hope Now and read about maybe that's not true. I'm aware now that maybe it's not true. Then I'm going to read through the site and go to some of our churches, which will be 18 churches will be featured every couple of months on this site. Maybe First Parish in Lincoln is one of those places. A person clicks on it, reads one of your stories, because we want them to all be real, embodied in the life of the churches. So it's not, you know, images that we're paying an actor to do like a, he gets us commercial. Um, but it'll be from here so that I might see you and then come to this church and go, I, I saw you on a site. So it's real and it's embodied. So now I'm aware that this might exist. I'm reading about these places and so I'm getting some knowledge. And the skill is like, how do you find these places? 
What would it be like in worship? So we're going to have some FAQs. You know, what, what might the experience be like if I went to worship? And we're going to talk about the diversity of types of worship you'll experience. We'll have markers for our churches on the Find Hope website. So if you're open and affirming, there will be a legend that will denote that. If you've gone through the accessible to all process in the United Church of Christ, a legend will say that. If you choose to ultimately become a wise congregation, which is the UCC's designation about um, being mental, uh, being aware of different mental health needs or um, not everybody is neurotypical in the same way and it, congregations who are investing and in learning more about that to prepare to welcome all of God's people, there'll be a marker to denote that. So we don't want to do a bait and switch. We want somebody to say, oh, I found this church. And they'll see, oh, none of those markers are here. So maybe that's not the church they choose. So they keep scrolling down and go, there's that open and affirming marker. I feel comfortable. There's an accessible to all. So if I'm in a wheelchair or I have another walking aid, I know that I'll be able to physically do that. This firm is going to do probably four months of aggressive marketing of the Find Hope Now website. Then we'll get to annual meeting, offer the statistics to our churches, um, and then each church will have access, like I said, to those digital resources. And then our hope is to have regional coaches. The Southern New England Conference has six regions, um, and that there will be coaches within each region who can meet with the congregation directly to talk about the E word, which we don't like, and it's called evangelism. <laughs> and I say the E word because I think we've allowed a certain ilk of faith to claim and own that word. So evangelism is someone who came, comes and knocks on your door on Saturday morning and tells you, confess these things to be loved, held, whatever. And I want to say collectively, we have allowed that. Because our belief is that, oh, if somebody's interested in this, they'll find their way here somehow. So what do we need to do? Just be here, and then maybe they'll come. And maybe 200 years ago, that was true, because there was no other place to go <laughs> than the meeting house or the parish to get this information. Um, my friends, that is not 2024. So we might also have to do some marketing. We might also have to do some E-word. And understand that it's going to be very different for somebody to say, would you like to be a part or visit a community that will love all of you? And we mean it. And we're going to make mistakes, but we're going to come back to the table. And we're not claiming to be perfect because we're not, and we don't believe you have to be perfect, but we are willing to be in conversation with each other. But what we can really promise you is that this is not bait and switch. You will get what we're telling you. You will meet these real people who found hope in these ways. And then maybe you might find a story of hope. To me, it's how do you offer some saturation in an environment that if I scroll through social media, if I look through the ilk of this country and faith and religion, it's pretty much, if, if we're honest, one note. And that one note is dangerous and harmful and scary. Now, I'll end by saying this. Last year, I was a keynote at University of Vermont. And um, I was invited to come on a Monday night at 7.30 PM in the midst of finals. <laughs> And the chaplain uh, assured me that nobody would come. <laughs> you know, he's like, you know, I'm sorry, it's Monday, and it's, so probably no one's coming. And but we're so grateful that you're here, and we'll film it, and maybe share it with somebody else, which is, you know, not necessarily a great value proposition in the middle of what was a snowstorm that weekend, and me driving up to Burlington. But you know, I always think you never know what opportunity would be there. We were in a room that's probably double the size of this room, and they were hosting this talk in the pub on campus. 7.30, it seemed like maybe the chaplain was right. But we say, well, let's give it five to 10 minutes, you know, churchy time. You got to wait for people to come, because they were on their way. By the time I started my keynote, the room was full, from the front to the back. Faculty, staff, and students in the midst of finals week and administrators came. We spent about an hour together. I spent about another hour after that. And the next week, all of the majority of the emails I received were from faculty, staff, and students at the University of Vermont. 
Each of them began or had within the body of those emails one salient line. I didn't know places like this existed. It's actually probably one of the more horrifying messages to get because that's on us. I didn't know. Places like this, like you talked about in your talk, which was right, the extravagant welcome, the God loves you, like you can be exactly who you are, like we, you know, we're all on this journey together. We do not believe we have all of the answers, like, you know, they didn't know. What could have been perceived as a rejection of any form of spirituality was really a rejection of the type of spirituality that had been presented. Second freebie, the Barner Group did a research process um, over the past seven months, um, and, and the research group that they ran, 84% of Americans post-COVID said they are open to a spiritual conversation. 84%. Not maybe a religious conversation and how we define it, but 84%, I'm open to a spiritual conversation. My friends, I'm worried that they might get he gets us as the conversation. And the openness will immediately become a deterrent based on what's, on the, what's behind the scenes. What a gift it would be if the 84%, maybe not all of the time, but even 20, 30, 40, 50% of the time encountered what you all are describing you might receive here at First Parish. So that's the imprint of Find Hope Now. That's why we should do it, need to do it, why it's urgent for me. Because I want to make sure that those 84% of people find hope and not something less than. So thank you. Any questions? Yeah, start with you and then go there. We have people online, of course, who want to be able to hear all this. I've got. <laughs> the, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, w in the beginning of your presentation here now, you spoke about uh, organizations that get their money from somewhere, but where do they get their money? <sighs> Primarily evangelical Christian but what what is the name of the the organization that gives them money? The, really, it's individual people I see. who are collectively pooling money together to fund. I mean, I, the term that's coming to my mind is big pharma, but it's like big religion. Um, part of the tension is that it's hidden money, often through other foundations or organizations that don't immediately give you the ilk to this but some great authors in a New York Times article and in another one in a USA Today article sort of wrote what they called an exposing article, um, basically describing that these people, the individuals themselves, are hidden. Um, they're donating money of, under the cover of other things. Um, there's not necessarily an overt, so it takes you, it would take a long time to dig to find out where that money is actually coming from. What they were able to find is that there were trails of some very similar type of funding and organizations that all share the same framework. Um, so I think it's intentionally meant that you would know, like, oh, it's Bill Withers from mm -hmm. Florida, you know, as much as where is all this money coming from in pockets of Texas and pockets of Florida? you know, um, and places where we, we know that the, the sentiment that's shared in these commercials isn't at all how that same money is being fueled to make some of the legislation in this country that's become dangerous. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Thank you for spending time with us today. Um, <clears throat> you get a chance to see a lot of churches and I wonder if you have anything that you have seen that might help us think about the fact that we've got on a typical Sunday 30 or 40-ish people online. Some of them are probably on the camera right now. And we would love to 
you know, get them more engaged or find ways that they feel comfortable, you know, logging in maybe so that we actually, you know, know who they are and, and so forth. Um, are there churches that you have seen that have done a good job of, you know, figuring out how to do that? Because it's a great addition to our community if we can make them feel welcome. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the conference has a digital minister, um, Reverend Eric Ely, um, and if he hasn't been connectional here, he would be, I think, a great person to engage in a deeper conversation because what Eric will do is come and have a, a, a conversation with the digital ministry here, ask what you're doing, what aren't you doing, what could you do to enhance, how to make this more accessible. The places where I think I've seen this successfully done um, is where the people who are watching virtually, they're not gonna have the exact experience of those who are gathered here embodied, but the church really does as much as it can to make it feel like you're here. So like during you know, prayers of the people or offering that someone is literally online saying, so I'm seeing that Bridget, you know, somebody from Alberta, Canada is asking for prayer about this. Bridget, thank you for your words. We see. So it becomes like you're breaking the fourth wall in theater. Like someone hears and knows that though they're not physically here, they're embodied. Give example. My grandmother's 88th birthday was yesterday um, and she was celebrating. And a Sunday before that, um, I was preaching at our home church um, and she wasn't filling up to coming to church. So during the service, the pastor's like, you know, Reverend Goodwin's grandmother, we see you. She was watching at home. Happy birthday. The whole congregation sang happy birthday. She wasn't there. I mean, they actually had a whole little reception for her, which I felt, oh God, she wasn't there. But they sang happy birthday to her in the fellowship hall. She had a cake. She had all these kind of things. And she was not physically there. And I thought, I mean, there was a little embarrassment on me because I was like, oh, God, I didn't know that they were doing all this. And maybe it's a waste. Of, you know, they bought this stuff. And she's like, but it wasn't. Because you would believe my grandmother was physically there. How she described, the church sang happy birthday to me today. And they had a fellowship after. Da, da, da. She was not there. You know, I mean, I brought her back a piece of cake, you know, but something about how she was invited into the space for her made the space tangible. So I think there's those are the edges. How do we not treat those people like a, we will acknowledge you at the beginning, maybe at the end, but really we are having the worship experience. And that's technically complicated. You have to remember, you have to balance what's happening here, but happening to somebody at home. You know, it, it is complex, but that's not going to go away. You know, that will be the entry point for many churches. People who used to have to physically come to see what is going on here can just watch you virtually. The other piece is that the most watched church hour in this country is 7 p.m. on a Wednesday. When we've pulled the analytics of how often people are watching your streamed service on Sunday, no, it's Wednesday. So, you know, now for the reality, these, you know, our four parents had really interesting thoughts because most traditional churches' Bible studies were on Wednesday at seven o'clock. That's a midweek point where people maybe have had a breath from all the activities on the weekends, they've had a couple of days in their life at work, and then they're like, oh God, eight o'clock at night, what do I need, seven o'clock at night? I wanna watch what happened on Sunday. So we have to pro problematize our understanding. Worship happens Sunday morning in this particular way within codified in this hour, and outside of that, the Holy Spirit, I don't know what she's doing. <laughs> she only shows up on Sunday, no. For some people, the Holy Spirit is alive on a Wednesday. For other people, it's Saturday morning. For other people, it's Sunday night after they got through skiing and brunching and everything else. And then they're like, yeah, what happened at First Parish today? So opening us up to that reality means that we bless and welcome people who are immediately present. We are thoughtful that there's people who are gonna watch this at some other point during the week. So is there a way to acknowledge that and make that relevant? And then how do we love the people who are embodied here and accept we may always have a virtual community that will never find themselves here? One of our churches in the Southern New England Conference, their moderator is from Chicago. Their moderator has never physically been to their church. 
they have been such an active online member that at annual meeting, the church voted that this virtual person that they've never met should become the moderator. That's the world in which we're living. This person isn't a distant person. I mean, they are actively involved in everything, anything that they can attend in Zoom. They're actively a participant. They ask questions. They send the money. They support the ministry. But they live in Chicago. But they found home in southern New England. I'm looking at our nominating committee. <laughs> I loved your, your sermon today, and I loved it when you asked what's in our hearts that are preventing us from seeing each other as us. As. And um, we're, I'm one of the members of the Racial Justice Committee, and we had um, worked a lot with Reverend James Ross, and he's gone, so we would like to have another link and, uh, of who we should get in touch with. We sent him the Racial Justice Newsletter, and we communicated quite a lot. And I went to one of his workshops on microaggression, which was great. So I just would like to have a way that we can find out who his replacement is and how we can be in touch. Because it's, I had no idea of what the UCC, how progressive the UCC was. And it was a, a real awakening for me. So thank you. Yeah, I want to answer in two ways. The tangible way is Reverend Noah Brewer Wallen. Um, is sort of the front-facing person for our diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the conference. What we did was um, did a reorg. We have an office in the conference called the Center for Transformational Leadership. For all intents and purposes, the easiest definition, it is the teaching and learning arm of the Southern New England Conference. So many things that would have been an outward-facing lecture series, teaching, course, class, everything will be filtered through the Center for Transformational Leadership. So that irrespective of what justice issue or church learning or whatever you particularly want to have access to, it is formatively a one-stop shop. So our diversity, equity, and inclusion ministries have been moved into the Center for Transformational Leadership. Boundary training for clergy in the Center for Transformational Leadership. Super Saturday, if you are unaware of that, which is sort of the annual gathering of workshops and presentations and things that the conference offers, which will be March the 9th um, in Sturbridge. Um, that day is called Foundations, which will be all of the ways in which our parishes need the foundational underpinning all through the Center for Transformational Leadership. So Noah Brewer Wallen is the name. Um, yeah, if you go to the Center for Transformational Leadership staff at sneucc.org, NOAA's contact will be immediately available. Here's the other tension around even how we codify DEI. My first meeting with the board of directors, literally the first one, I was asked the question, how will you continue to live into our diversity commitment, our racial justice commitment? And I said, I don't necessarily see myself doing that programmatically in a way that's like, this is the racial justice program over there. I want to challenge us as an organization to have this lens be a part of everything that we do. So it becomes a part of our systemic way of moving forward. When often we treat racial justice as an add-on, it's that committee's job over there. They are going to bring the books, they're going to bring the speakers, they're going to do this. But it's not going to be the council's job, right? It's not going to be the nominating committee's job. It's not going to be the outreach team's job. Like, we don't have to think about that because that committee is doing the work. That's not a proof text against having a committee. But the goal of a committee is to make sure that that's in every conversation that you have. That's my functional understanding as the conference. So when we think about the board, who is on the board? When we think about our finance committee, who is making the decisions in our finance committee? You know, when we think about whether it's nominating or whether we think about our new marketing team, all of that, how and what are the, what's the system whereby which we recruit and ask people to serve with that lens in place? I'll give an example, annual meeting. Annual meeting this year is going to begin with gospel music and call and response and all of these kind of things. And then when that is over, you're probably going to go back to a UCC hymn. 
And then when you finish with a UCC hymn, you might go back to a different style of worship. And someone's like, well, do you feel that they'll be disjointed or no, because no, it won't be because everybody who comes to annual meetings should find something that they are comfortable with and used to, but something that challenges and stretches them. That's a different lens than, well, DEI work is about the workshops and the trainings we do, but we don't have to think about that in our annual meeting worship. I mean, we're a predominantly white conference with predominant ways of worship and everything else. So let's just do that to make everybody comfortable at annual meeting, but then we'll go do a workshop on Negro spirituals and Black History Month. To me, they can't be separate. They're a part of one. So that's my encouragement about how do each of us take on the banner of this um, and not codify it. And though we have the office and it's embodied in CTL, I really want to stretch us that every single one of staff is asking that question about diversity, equity, and inclusion from accessibility concerns to are we thinking about all of the ways in which people might process information um, to the lenses whereby which people will hear what we're talking about. You know, I think that's part of it. That's great. Um, I had a question, Darrell. Um, so one thing some of us might not know is the Southern New England Conference is relatively new. Back to when, back when I was ordained, I was I was ordained in, uh, through the the Massachusetts Conference. Uh, Nancy Taylor, who came and preached here in January, used to be the conference minister of the Massachusetts Conference way back. And um, it's cool for me to to be part of the Southern New England Conference now. Uh, all these resources, it's almost overwhelming to go on the website and there's really so much going on. Um, but I wanted to ask a question about denominational identity. You and I talked about that in our little conversation last week. And it's been interesting for me to, to be here now, a uh, congregation that is, uh, you know, t two, two denominations merged together. I think a lot of people who are drawn here are drawn here because of the the big spiritual tent that First Parish offers. And I think there's almost a sense of like a post-denominational identity too. And so I wanted to just to ask you from your perspective to talk about that as we're thinking about sort of the future of the church, the future of, you know, quote unquote, liberal religion. Um, what, yeah, what do you have to say about the appeal of a post-denominational identity? Thanks, Nate. That's a little simple question. <laughs> so I, I had the privilege and honor, uh, well, I still serve on the United Church of Christ Board of Directors, but I used to be the chair of the marketing committee. Um, and so I also had a member of my church at the time who had, uh, in her career, had been the vice president of marketing at Disney, Clorox, all these major companies. So she was listening to us talk about UCC identity, and then she pretty much immediately said, I see a couple of problems immediately. We had done a survey. Most of the time we say United Church of Christ, people heard Church of Christ. And Church of Christ is a dramatically different denomination than the UCC, you know? And then some people, if you ask them, particularly in New England, they weren't UCC, they were congregational. Right. And then you're like, well, what is that? And I thought I was at a UCC church where you are, but we say congregational in these places. So I think there is some if I were just thinking about our own half of your context, um, it, it, you know, we don't even know sometimes. It's like, well, which are we and what are we saying and what are we doing? If I think about the amount of people who are joining an organization today are not really joining it because of the label as much as they're joining it based on the values and beliefs of where things are. Um, I jokingly say that I have multiple titles in the same conference. Sometimes in Massachusetts, when I go to a church, they say, this is our bishop. And why are they saying that I'm their bishop? Because most of the newest members of their church are former Catholics. They don't understand a conference minister. Like, where, where is the conference and when is it occurring? <laughs> Can I register for it? You know, like it doesn't matter to them. So they use a term that most people make sense of. If I were to say I was the bishop in Rhode Island, I mean, they may be off with my head. Like, you know, and then in some place else, in another parish in, in Massachusetts, I'm the minister and president because that's what the person was called before. And then if you're in the Southern New England reality, I am the executive conference minister because we have more churches than any other region. And so all of that stuff is in speak. 
most of the people externally won't even know what we're talking about. And even after they joined this thing, they still won't know, to be honest, no offense, but what a UUA is versus a UUC versus this, it, it won't matter. Do I feel loved, seen, held here? And how I experience the divine, will you reject me, tell me I'm wrong, convert me over here? Like those are the questions that I think people are asking. Now, having said all of that, the reality is binding together within a group of people with a common purpose gives resources, gives siblinghood in a different way, and I'm whether or not we like the reality of this, you do have more strength in numbers. So I'm thoughtful about how we hold both a generosity of spirit and openness about who we individually might want to be, but then the collective buy-in of who we might be as 600 churches in New England. If the value proposition of 600 churches, 387 of which are open and affirming, a growing number of which are deciding and discerning that they want to be wise conferences, mental health aware congregations, a growing number are discerning to be accessible to all. A number of our churches are the only churches in their town that are talking about LGBT inclusion, are talking about uh, racial justice, are talking about gender equity or socioeconomic concerns. I mean, often these particular parishes are the only ones who are even willing to broach the topic. And friends, I want to say it goes down to the basis of in some towns in New England, you will not get buried based on what you believe and what tradition you are part of. And Western Mass and other places where it's the UCC congregation that might have 15 to 17 people left who still have the cemetery attached and they will say, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are. At the end of life, you will be welcome here too. So what does that look like if that church in that small town in Western Massachusetts doesn't believe they're alone? Knows that there are some other parishes near them that will stand with them, right? So that's, I think that's the tension, Nate, that we struggle between. It's like rugged individualism in New England. And like, I don't want to too much identify with that because not all of those things are exactly who we are. So we're going to do our own thing over here. And then you become isolated because we can't find the common thread. Hope to me as conference minister is the common thread amongst our churches. We got a problem. If you cannot find hope in this place of people gathering, then let's really talk about why you exist. So like if we can each identify that, then I'm hoping that through crowdsourcing of openness, people might go, wow, if I'm a place of hope for this, how could I not be a place of hope for queer people? If I'm a place of hope for climate, how dare I not think about being a place of hope for racial justice? Like I think together we press each other, but when I'm over here on my thing and you're over there doing your thing, you know, we're not there. The other sad part about progressive places is we're actually some of the most discriminatory places because it's like if you do not subscribe to everything we have said as progressive, then we will immediately cast you out. I was at a church recently where very inclusive church, inclusive language throughout the entire worship, and a visitor got up. Father God, he, 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 he. And when I tell you, nobody in that church blinked. Great. They moved on. And I was kind of stunned a little bit. I was sitting there like, how is this going to play out? Because this person, Father God, he, da, 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 da. there was no deviation from it. Next person comes up. The blood of Jesus is so, da, da, da. I watched again. Because, you know, blood theology and UCC church, what is going to, nobody blinked. When that person finished, people clapped for their song and everything they did, and they moved on. And it was the most fascinating worship experience. I mean, I was, if I had popcorn, I would be like, what is going to happen in this place? So I followed up with the pastor afterward. I'm like, what? I, I'm, this happened, and then this happened. And, then, and they said, because if we're going to be who we say we are, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Then we better mean it. For some people, they're welcome here with gendered theology language. 
for some people, they're welcome here with very conservative Christian ideology, but somehow they found themselves here. For others of us, God isn't embodied in gender. God isn't, God is beyond our even explanation and words. And those people are here too. And we don't tolerate each other. We love each other. And I understand that when I'm talking about God with you, it's going to be embodied in a particular way. And I hear it and say, that's your way. And when I talk about God, I'm going to use the language that makes sense for me. And you respect that that's my way. I mean, it was this fascinating thing. Now, why am I fascinated by something that most of us in a UCC context say every Sunday? That is the moniker of the UCC. No matter who you are, stop. Or where you are, stop. On life's journey, you are not maybe, possibly, we're thinking about it, are welcome here. But do we really believe that? Because the wrong person gets up and says the wrong thing, and you know we will in, immediately. We'll get uncomfortable, we'll be, oh, 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 God. Oh. It, but if we really mean that, then what is that, where is the bend? And it's uncomfortable. I mean, I'm the conference minister and I was sitting there going, ooh, <laughs> this is very interesting, like wow. And yet, they taught me something. Because again, I mean, I was watching, I was sitting up front, I could see every face, not one blink, not one. It was like, in that particular church, what are they, what's their ministry, refugee ministry? What's their ministry? The least and the last and sometimes kicked to the side? What's their ministry? If you are marginalized, you are here? What's their ministry? Your socioeconomic status does not prevent you from having a seat at the table. I mean, these were the things that I read about on their website, the pastor and I interviewed about, but I saw it in, in flesh and I was like, we need this. Like, we all collectively need it. So I will check myself the next time I'm in some place and one of the key people up doing the ministry isn't using inclusive language. That's their way. And I'm not talking about harm, right? Because there are things that are harmful. We see it, it's vicious, it's meant with intent to harm or maim somebody. I'm not suggesting except that. But what I am saying is how do we build room for people to grow in their own theological understanding without suggesting to be a member or to be a part of us or to be welcome here, you must subscribe to XYZ. That to me is also the that's other great. I think that's very, very relevant to what we're thinking about and working with today. Thank you, Darrell. Yes, thank you thank so you much for being with us. Much. What a treat. We're so lucky.